Okay, we're going to go ahead and get our meeting started. We do have a chock full agenda tonight. Thank you all for coming. Today is Thursday, February 7th. The time is 7.30. This meeting is being recorded and videotaped. Copies are available in the Selectman's office, or you can watch us directly from the website. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask everyone to rise and please join Julia Morland and Colleen Moore in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The first item on our agenda is a presentation of a proclamation to Susan Moran. Susan, if you'll join me up here. One of the best things about working in town hall is that you get to meet some really wonderful people and work with them. One of those people is Susan Moran, who has been the Republican registrar for uh, certainly my time here on the Board of Selectmen. And it truly has been a pleasure to work with you. It's, it really is a good example of how um, town government works in a real nonpartisan way in Weston. So it really has been my pleasure, and I'm so happy to present this proclamation to you. Whereas Susan Moran and her family have been part of the Weston community since 1994, and whereas Susan Moran has faithfully and cheerfully executed the duties of registrar of voters and deputy registrar of voters, assuring the rights of every eligible voter in Weston, regardless of party affiliation during local, state, and federal elections, and whereas Susan Moran is a member in good standing of Weston's Republican Town Committee, and whereas Susan Moran has been an active member of Weston's Northfield Congregational Church, where she sings alto in the church choir. Let's <laughs> 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 yeah, well, <laughs> And whereas Susan Moran has been a consistent supporter of education through her past membership in Weston's PTOs and a champion for women's education through her longtime association as a member of the PEO, the Philanthropic Educational Organization. And whereas the town of Weston will miss Susan Moran's depth of knowledge and enthusiasm for the position of registrar of voters and her dedication to Weston's unique form of town government. Now therefore, I, Gail Weinstein, first select woman of the town of Weston, Connecticut, do hereby proclaim tomorrow, February 8, 2015, as Susan Moran Day, I, I didn't get to write a proclamation, Susan. Um, I didn't get to write a proclamation, but I, I just wanted to add to that. that um, when I first started doing town government stuff, and th I think this picks up on a theme that Gail had, I had no idea who was which party. And I think that what that, what that really um, demonstrates and exemplifies is the way that this town has really been able to totally overstep issues that are party related. Even though we have very viable and active parties, but they don't get in the way of effective government, and they don't get in the way of serving people the way that they're supposed to. Um, I would love to think that a few people slightly higher up in government would uh, take a, a, a page. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> political. I would love to see the same sort of cooperation um, that you have demonstrated um, and um, the camaraderie that you have, have extended um, on a broader level. And I love riding the train to and from New York with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say it, it's a two-way street, and Laura Smith's is a phenomenal person to work with, and um, hey. absolutely. Thanks again for your service. Just uh, Susan, I I did know exactly what party you were from, <laughs> <laughs> but I I add my thanks uh, for your great service, and uh, the Moran family is a very important family in this town, as there are so many others. Thank you for all you did. Thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda, we have a very special presentation tonight from Julia Morledge and Colleen Moore, 
who want to ask the Board of Selectmen to eliminate plastic bags from the town of Weston. So girls, if you'll join us up here, and the floor is yours. You want to, you know, they can put it on the chair. Do my budget presentation. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia Marley, and I'm Colleen Moore, and this is our presentation on why plastic bags should be banned from Western Connecticut. These are the reasons that we believe are most important. Americans throw away 1 billion plastic bags every year, but only 1 to 3 percent are ever recycled. Plastic bags kill thousands of marine animals yearly. Plastic bags take 1,000 years to disintegrate into even smaller particles that still keep polluting the earth. And making plastic bags uses millions of gallons of petroleum that still keeps polluting the earth. I mean, no. Um, we plan to propose to Mr. McGee, the owner of Peter's Western Market, the idea of using cloth bags, which are reusable, so he wouldn't have to keep ordering them after the initial demand. As you can see, we have over 150 signatures from people in the Western agreeing that indeed plastic bags should be banned from Western. We do sell these plastic bags for some things, like garbage bags and in the produce section, but if you want, there are cloth bags for checkout that are just as durable. I got this at the Western Spirit Store in the town center. <laughs> if you ever go to Shop and Stop in Westport, you can see that they do not have plastic bags and that they give you five cents back every time you fill a cloth bag. So many people feel good about using cloth bags. That's because in Westport, plastic bags are illegal. However, this may not work for Mr. McGee. San Francisco is one of the first places in America to eliminate plastic bags. We believe that everyone in America should follow suit. Here is a list of all the places around the globe that have banned plastic bags. As you can see, many places around the world have banned plastic bags. There's San Francisco, Westport, and even Mumbai who land plastic bags from their larger towns and cities. Why can't we ban plastic bags from our small town? We understand that Mr. McGee may not agree with us on this matter. We would love to hear lots of opinions, and we would love to have Mr. McGee's input as well. We do know and acknowledge that no plastic bags may mean more money for Mr. McGee to spend on paper bags, since plastic bags are cheap. But we could make a drastic difference in our environment if we eliminated plastic bags. We think that it would be a good idea if Mr. McGee could have a conversation about the situation with us because then we wouldn't have to speak for him. We would love to show him our reasons, and we would love to hear his reasons on what he thinks. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. We would love to hear your thoughts on this. Okay. Thank you, girls. That was outstanding. And Tomorrow is put your PowerPoint up on the town website so that everyone can see the hard work that you did and uh, look at the campaign to ban plastic bags that you're looking to do. Um, I will open up the floor to questions from the selectmen. Well, let me go through one um, excellent job. Um, you, you laid it out in a very methodical and thoughtful way, so thank you very much for doing that. And I think um, it's wonderful to see people in fifth, fourth grade. Fantastic. It, feel that they can actually make a difference. Um, I had a couple quick questions for you. Have you talked to anybody in town center? Have you talked to Mr. McGee? Or is, are you coming to us first and the hope that there will be some attention paid and then you'd have a subsequent conversation? Um, Deirdre Doran, the head of the Weston Sustainability Committee, had a meeting with Mr. McGee mm -hmm. and she got his opinion and we had a meeting with her and she told us um, what he 
thinks about it. So we have not talked to him, but we have heard what he thinks. And I think that just one piece of it, uh, suggestion for you, a piece of advice. I think when you're looking at putting a, a law into place or suggesting, it has to be done fairly. So I think you have to really think, are there other um, stores, are there other uh, businesses in Weston that would be affected in a similar fashion? If you think of town center, you should think about whether the hardware store or the pharmacy, you don't want to pick out a specific individual. You want to make sure that it applies fairly to everybody. So as you're going about this, I would suggest that you um, talk to the store owners of everybody in town center to see how they feel about it, not just the one that we, we've talked about here. But I commend you. I think this is a wonderful example of uh, community involvement at a, at a very young age. So thank you. Dennis? Um, I, I'm amazed at what a clear, uh, cogent presentation that was. It was really excellent, and I thank you for it. Um, I have I have one question. You you mentioned that Mr. McGee may not may not agree. Um, I was wondering if, and it sounds like you've done a lot of research on different communities that have dealt with this issue. Have you uh, come upon any communities that have? Um, um, encourage the use of paper and cloth rather than plastic uh, as a voluntary um, me method, or um, have, has that not come to your attention? Um, well, um, we do, in your um, handout, there is um, something about um, a city in California where they charge 10 cents for paper bags, and we think that that might be a good idea in Weston as well because um, then the owner of the store could um, take the money from the, um, take the money that people pay for paper bags to help buy more paper cloth bags. Great, thank Sounds you. Sounds like a good idea. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about next steps because I don't want you to just make your presentation and then have it, have it die there. Um, I think one thing that would be helpful that I'm happy to facilitate is a conversation uh, between you two, perhaps get the sustainability committee involved, as well as all of uh, the store owners that are in Weston <coughs> Center. And what we'll see if we can do is find some kind of compromise between what you're proposing and what might be best for them and see if we can work together. And then we can bring it back to the board at a later time with our findings after that. Does that sound like a plan so that we can keep it moving forward? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Deirdre. Yeah, I'd just like to mention that, yes, Jim, um, and I, I agree with you, Dave, uh, all the store owners should be consulted, and this this is a, a community of, of merchants that should be involved together. Um, I did speak with Jim on numerous occasions, and, um, and interestingly, today I was at the bank uh, talking with Jeannie, and she said that she and Jim were talking about the possibility of uh, uh, creating a, communi a community of uh, sustainable bag uh, that people can use. And I just want to show you something because it's so super. And I'm going to let you just throw, uh, pass this around. These are, um, this is a, a design that was made by a high school student. And we had an art contest. And the whole idea of this was that we would produce this on a Do you want to just bag. turn it around so the camera could pick it up? There you go. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, and so I just want you to see because this might be something we could uh, include on one of our beds. So please pass that around and just take a real look at it because it's so lovely. I never even showed you guys this thing. So you'll see more. Anyway, I, I think we can come up with solutions. Um, I just, you know, I mean, we can manage something. Right. I, you know, I think, I think whenever you're trying to um, change a process that's been in place, you have to get all the parties that are involved or that might be impacted around the table to sit and have a conversation. I think that's always the first way. I think that Mr. McGee and the other merchants need to hear uh, why you have concerns about the, the plastic bags and why you feel that they should switch to paper. And I think that you guys need to hear what their concerns are and how it might impact their businesses if they have to switch to uh, uh, not using plastic bags anymore. So I think the next step would really be to get everyone around the table, sit and have that conversation. I'm happy to facilitate it. 
I do have your emails, and um, we'll try to arrange that for after school around a Saturday one day. Does that sound good? Yeah. Any other questions for Julia or Colleen? I, Mr. I, Saltzman. I, I, I could uh, commend the students. They are a great example of what a Board of Education does with our little ones and brings them up to think, which is a very, very important thing. And I think that, Gail, you're on the right track of having a consortium of our vendors in town come up and discuss it. Because there are a lot of pitfalls and there are a lot of positives. And I have to tell you something very disturbing on last night's news. The champion of bad going away was San Francisco, as they researched. In the San Francisco area, they did not listen to the Center for Disease Control about the germs and the horrible stuff that happens in the bags, and they have to be sterilized constantly, and they weren't. And five people passed away because of a virus that was passed on through the mesh bags. The norovirus was one of them, and that is a problem particularly in the town of Weston, where if you use bleach to clean the bags to kill the bugs, it goes into our septic system, and that destroys the good bacteria, and your septic system gets clogged, and that costs a lot of money to fix. So while they're noble in their mission, there are a lot of pitfalls that have to be answered by real authoritative people like the health district and, and everybody else, and I think your idea of bringing the vendors together and having a meeting like Dennis and Ken did when they did the town charter. Everybody had a chance to say something good, bad, or indifferent. It worked, and they listened, and I know that the selectmen will listen, but this is far from a finished product. And thank you, girls. I, I commend you for doing what you did up to now, but I think there's a lot more work to do. Thank, thank you, Don. I appreciate your comment. Girls, thank you so much for coming, and uh, I will be in touch with you next time. Okay, next item on our agenda is discussion decision regarding the reappointment of Julie Stinger to the Pedestrian and Bicycle Committee. Julie, if you'll join us up here. Okay. Shh. Julie, if you can tell us uh, a little bit about your time on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee and why you'd like to continue. Hey, um, I'm Julie Siddo. I've lived in town for over 25 years. I've raised three children here, and my husband and I plan to stay in town. We have no plans to leave, even though the kids have all gone. And um, I'm a runner, cyclist, walker, dog walker, um, served on the PTO, directed the Western Road Race, helped run the New Year's Day race that used to leave right from this town hall. And uh, I just think it's a beautiful place to run, walk, bike, and just be, but it's not always as safe as it can be. And um, I think the timing is right, as you said before. Um, everybody in town seems to be working really well together. Uh, doesn't matter you know, what committee you're on, everybody is working for the common good. In the two years that I've been on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee, um, Stun. Thank you. In, in those two years, I found that I've been, we've been able to work with the selectman, with Chief Troxell, with the engineer, with Joe Lameda, um, with Dave Unger. Everybody has done their best to say, how can we make this a better place for Westernites of all ages? And that's one of my, I've been on PTOs, but um, I'm looking now, I'm getting older, and I'm looking, how can this be a better, safer, recreational place for the young children right through to our seniors? So um, that's why I'd like to continue the work we've done. And um, I just love Western and love to see us all be able to walk freely around, particularly the town center. Um, we've got a lot around here that people don't see because they either park at the center and drive off. And um, in, in the coming years, I've learned since being on this committee that 
both the, the two uh, intersections in town are going to be redone by the state, Northfield Road and School Road. Every town around us has a walkable village center. Wilton, Norwalk, Westport, and now Georgetown, Fairfield. Georgetown, if you haven't been up there recently, is beautiful now. And um, we can have that in here because we already have the crossings, the places for the crossings are in place. There are three crossings on that stretch of town and none of them work effectively. They need modernizing, they're not visible. Um, and it's not just you know, making it safe for walkers, we have to educate everybody. We have to educate, education is a big part of our committee's work. We have to educate our young drivers. We have to educate you know, um, responsible driving so they're not distracted. And working together with uh, the chief to enforce laws we already have. There's a lot that the committee can do, but we need help from everyone. And I just see everybody's working together, so I'd like to stay on this committee. Great. As you know, we do have uh, two grants that we're trying to apply for to get the sidewalks, which would go a long way into enhancing the town center. Great. Any questions for Julie? No. Very compelling arguments. Thank you. Hearing none, if someone would make a motion to reappoint Julie. Um, I move to reappoint Julie Sidhu to Western Bicycle Pedestrian Committee for a term to expire December 31, 2014. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is discussion decision regarding the reappointment of Betsy Perrine, Reverend Wilson, Jane Anglum Young, and Catherine Saldinger to the Veterans Affairs Committee. Um, none of them were able to make it tonight. Uh, we, we, actually, we actually just uh, appointed Catherine recently, and I felt that the three of us knew uh, Betsy, Reverend Wilson, and Jane well enough uh, that I really did not want to hold this up any longer since their term actually just expired December 31st. So we're a little bit behind the eight ball here. So if it's okay with you guys, I would appreciate a motion to reappoint. I move to reappoint Betsy Perrigan, Reverend Bernard Wilson, Jane Angham Young, and Catherine Saldinger to the Veterans Affairs Committee for a term to expire December 31, 2014. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, uh, the Legal Review Committee has been um, working diligently. However, they have not finished their mission. Uh, their term expired, I believe, uh, January 31st. Uh, so I had a conversation with Kevin Korsh. They do feel that they're on the right track and they have asked for an extension. Uh, I was thinking um, May 16th, which gives them a couple more months and by then they should have their work completed. So if uh, someone would like to make a motion to extend the term of the Legal Review Committee. Uh, I move to extend the term of legal review committee to May 16, 2013. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda is discussion decision regarding the appointment of Laura Davidson as Weston's representative to serve on the Western Connecticut Convention and Visitors Bureau. Laura, you can join us up here. And if you just want to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to serve on this committee representing Weston. Sure. Well, I have a public relations firm in New York City called Laura Davidson PR, and I specialize in travel and tourism. So I've been doing that for over 25 years, which means I understand the world of tourism. Don't always understand what the Connecticut Board of Tourism is doing, but I'd like to represent our town so that when I come to understand more of what your issues and concerns might be with tourism, I can address it with them. What I'd also like to do as part of the board is maybe help influence some of what they're doing on the marketing communication side. I mean, the advertising is one thing, but I don't think that they're using their PR resources to the best of their abilities. I think there's a lot more they could do in social media, a lot of work that I've done with some of my clients that maybe I can help influence what they're doing. I'm not interested in that as an account. I'm just interested in representing Weston on that board and maybe giving them a little bit more direction that would help benefit us and benefit Fairfield County. Also just as an FYI, the woman who is in charge of PR for Fairfield County and um, Litchfield County, Litchfield. Right? Right. Janet Sarah is a friend and colleague of mine for about 15 years, so I know I would work very closely with her. 
said. The, the travel and tourism board has gone through many changes uh, in the state of Connecticut, none of which I think are positive. I'm sorry, Senator Boucher, that I have to say that. Um, one of the things that they did a couple of years ago is they tried to regionalize the tourism centers. And rather than thinking of, okay, where should Fairfield County go with, like maybe New Haven County, because they're both along the shore, they decided that our partner should be Litchfield County. And when you look at those two regions of Connecticut, to me, they just don't really seem to match. But we are stuck with this partnering, and so we have to try to find a way so that Fairfield County and our areas are represented. To me, I look at the area we, where we live, and travel and tourism could be so much for this area in terms of economic development. And the way I look at that is we improve economic development through travel and tourism in Westport, and Norwalk, and other places that are close by, Greenwich, it could only mean a positive for us in terms of housing and getting people to come live in our areas, which is why I think it's so important that we promote that area. Um, and oh, by the way, the travel and tourism budget is zero. So, so to have zero budgets before. So to have to have experts like Laura who are willing to volunteer their time and effort to this cause, I think is so incredibly important for the state and for our town and region. I also just so you know, I used to have a weekend house up in Litchfield County. Oh, really? So, and that's one of the so reasons. It's your fault. Well, no, but listen, <laughs> I can spin anything into a positive. One of the reasons <laughs> I moved to West End was because I had I lived in Manhattan and we had a weekend house in Norfolk. And I said to my husband Andy Bill, who I think one of you guys knows him, but um, I said to him, the only way you'll get me to leave the city is if we can find if I can find a town like Norfolk, Connecticut that's commutable. I will live there, where I can have two acres of land, a nice old house, hiking trails, you know, not have to look into my neighbor's garden. If you find that for me, I will move out of the city. And that's why we moved to Weston. So there you go. That's a good message. Fantastic. <laughs> Keep out there. Any questions for Laura? No, I think, I think you're ideally suited to help. And um, I, I thank you for volunteering. And um, we'd love to have you back to get a report on how you've reformed this <laughs> organization. <Absolutely. laughs> I, have I, I have a feeling they're, they're looking at uh, some, some new energy here. And the, the letter of endorsement which we received from the executive director of the, uh, of the Bureau is, is, you know, it speaks very highly, so I would uh, clearly defer to them in terms of that sort of judgment. Great. I'd entertain a motion. I move to appoint Laura Davidson as Weston's representative to serve on, on Western Connecticut Convention and Visitors Bureau Board of Directors for a term to expire December 31, 2015. Sorry. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, the next item on our agenda is very interesting. It's a discussion decision regarding the purchase of 48 Northfield Road by the town of Weston. Um, 48 Northfield Road is the piece of property that's right on the corner there that um, was formerly owned uh, by George Gadara where he had his, his law practice there. Uh, I've been having conversations with the bank that currently owns the property and um, I think that it's at the point that we need to bring it to the public to see if there's any interest in the residents from the re residents of the town of Weston to see if they're interested in, in uh, purchasing this property. Um, one of the conversations that we have with the bank is that uh, they would look to sell it for the town of Weston for seven hundred and fifty thousand, which I think is a very good fair price for the town of Weston and would complete the corner of the property that we have here. So first, I'll open up the floor to the board of selectmen, and then if people in the uh, uh, in the audience want to comment, I'm happy to hear some comments. Well, the one thing I would say, I mean, I guess there are a couple things. Um, when we had the discussions about the town, the plan of development, um, there were some some components of that plan that we talked about with the planning and zoning commission about the need to ensure access and availability years down the road. That. And I think they were making the comments specifically about the Frompson Strasso property at the time, that you, you don't want to you don't want to take any steps today that would preclude a use 20, 50, 100 years down the road, when we'll all still be on the board of select. <laughs> right. um, and and I think that in a similar manner, when you look at the, the the infrastructure of the town, we have this property, we have the library, we have the you know public health, public I'm sorry, public safety behind us. 
Um, and then there's kind of a gap, and we've had a trailer in the yard there. We have the property across the street, the Jarvis property. We have uh, decade-old um, uh, portables next to the school administration building, and then we have the school campus. And for me, this represents a, a kind of a once in a decade or once in a 20 year, 30 year period to acquire a piece of property at, at, a, at a price which I think is, is quite attractive for the town of Weston. Um, to give us the possibility for current use when we start reallocating space as we've talked about. Um, and especially with the decision to take the school's property off the, off the table um, to look at a rationalization of where we put uh, town employees. Um, the number of times that people come in here looking for uh, planning and zoning, which is up next to the school administration building, I think it would give us the potential um, immediately and down the road to have a contiguous property that kind of ties in town hall, the library, the fire department, police, um, the corner here, and leading to town center. And if I think back to the comments um, when we were talking about sustainability and the, and the, and the, the, um, the uh, idea of a walkable town center, that's the one gap that we have at this point. Um, and I think that allowing that property to come to the town for a, an attractive price would be a, a, a very solid way of ensuring access for future generations to a contiguous property um, that would serve for town government and other purposes. Dennis, any comments? Uh, well, I, I, I agree with that, that sentiment in general. I think, I think that um, if we're gonna think about how the town should look and how it should work, having that, that piece of property would sort of fill in a gap that, we, that exists today. The price is, in fact, um, very reasonable given uh, the location and the nature of the property. Um, and I, I, I know that there have been discussions in the past at uh, two or three times that price. Um, so this is an opportunity that I think we have to pursue. Um, at the same time, you know, I think in, in times of, you know, tight budgets and, um, you know, decreasing population in the schools and uh, excess uh, capacity, uh, we really have to think carefully about um, an overall plan for the use of our, our town properties and to make sure that we are using them in the most efficient way and the least expensive way possible. Um, I'm, you know, I'm in favor of pursuing this. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in developing properties that can be used for the, uh, the benefit of the entire community that, that bring us together more as a community, uh, like La Chotte, uh, which I think is a, is a very important opportunity that we have to pursue. I think this can be similar to that if we create a, a beautiful town center that people can walk through and enjoy and, and, and be together in. Um, so I'm in favor of pursuing it, but with a plan. And I, can I just make one other point? Sure. Because I'm a lawyer, I can't help it. The, there, we, this is an option agreement, um, and I, I have to applaud you for the, the negotiation. We're not paying a fee for an option. Um, we're committing to uh, seek approvals in good faith. I just wanted to be absolutely clear on the record that um, from my standpoint, this agreement does not bind us to buy the property. And nothing, it, nothing binds us. And we have a process that we have to go to that I'm happy to explain when you're. Right. And, I, and so we have to go through that process. And I, I, this agreement, from my standpoint, I want it on the public record does not bind us to, to purchase the property, and if it does not go through the various approvals, uh, we have no liability to the, to the seller. Are, are you talking about the memorandum of understanding? Yes. The reason why, uh, it was actually a town attorney that suggested a memorandum of understanding, because what she didn't want to happen is that we go through our process, which will take several months, four or five months, by the time we finish everything, and then they sell it out from under us. So that's really the reason for the memorandum right. of understanding, so that we're both bargaining in, in good faith. Um, the process that we have to go through to uh, purchase or sell property uh, is such that we would have to bring it to planning and zoning and ask for an 824 referral. They would have to go through their public hearing process and determine whether it's an appropriate uh, use or in this case purchase for the, the town of Weston, bring it back here. If they vote in favor of that, uh, then we can 
uh, figure out how we're going to pay for it, whether it's going to Board of Finance and asking for a supplemental, working with the bank who has uh, indicated a willingness to work with us as far as interest rates, um, and then we would vote on it. So it's not necessarily an easy process. I also think that because this is the first conversation about it and it is a big decision on the town, that rather than bringing it to planning and zoning right away, what I would like to do is at our first meeting in um, March, um, have the first item on our agenda, public comment on this subject, because I think it's really important that we get input from the public regarding if we should proceed with the state 24 and the purchase of this property as well. Um, Dennis, you had mentioned use for the property. Uh, as everyone knows, we thought that we were on full steam ahead to um, take over portions of Hurlbut, the North House wing of the school, for office space use. Uh, the Board of Education publicly announced that um, because of the Newtown tragedy, they wanted to take that off the table for now. Um, we have, have employees that are in a portable building um, that will have been there for 13 years, and the useful life of that building is 10 years. So we have to start thinking about what we're going to do with those town employees. And to me, if we can find a way to bring land use back to this side of the campus, it makes sense. And I think if we take a look at that uh, first floor of that property, we could very easily fit our land use in there, have a parking lot that's shared between our two facilities, and, and we could make it work. Um, the one thing I do want to make sure that you guys are both aware of that it is in a historic district and therefore we will be obligated to go to the historic district commission which is always fun. Um, Don, <laughs> let us finish our discussion and then, and then I'm happy to, to take comments from the audience. Um, the other piece of this which I do want to bring up which I think may be a little bit of a touchy subject for the town but I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. Um, we were having conversations about how we were going to fund this and the question of which property should the town have? Should we maintain properties, that you, as you had said, Dennis, that we don't necessarily have a use for? So the other topic of conversation came up is should we perhaps consider selling the Jarvis property, which is right across the street from the Gadara property, and use the proceeds to help fund the purchase of the Gadara property? Uh, right now we have the Parks and Recreation Department in the Jarvis house. It's really not appropriate for office space use. We make do. Um, but we have our director of Parks and Recreation who is upstairs um, in a bedroom. And that's where his office is. And if you are handicapped in any way, you can't get upstairs because there's a staircase. And I, I really have a problem with that. So you can get into the building. You, he can come down and meet with you. Uh, but it's really not designed effectively for office space. Um, we do use the two garages on there to store our parks and rec equipment, our mowers, our tractors. We would have to find another location to store it. But again, I think that this is something that we should bring to the public. And I think the conversation should be, um, number one, uh, do the residents of this town favor purchasing the Gadara property? Number two, do the residents of the town favor the sale of the Jarvis property to pay for that. And number three, whether the purchase of the Gadara property should be contingent on the sale of the Jarvis property. So. I think that makes perfect sense. Okay. Any other comments from the board before I open it up to the floor? No. Okay. Don, I knew you'd be the first one. I, I would sort of agree with David to make a start approach to the town of Weston. It, it is all good. What troubles me, though, is you haven't done your engineering. If you notice in the past year, the corner house that you're looking at has been stripped on the outside, and all of the hazardous paint was removed and it was repainted. I don't think anything was done to the inside. From previous owners, I have heard over the years, there's no insulation in the walls. You're you correct. have to take the walls down, rebuild them, put insulation, you're going to put bodies in there and heat it. Uh, right now, you, that should be done as a due diligence. You also own not only the Jarvis house, but the Ivy Moore cottage, which people tell me is falling apart, nobody's maintaining it. You have Minerva Hetty's house, which is just sitting there. Mm -hmm. You have the Lashat house. If you're not spending the money to maintain historic town buildings, Really, what makes you think you're going to maintain that as an office building? Yes, you can park off of my town hall and put a pathway through the back and 
get rid of the parking problems there. But it, it deserves a lot of pre-fixing. Get your engineers, get your carpenters, get your contractors in. Find out what it will cost you above the 750000 to move a body in there. And you did probably did a good job, Gail, in getting an option. But I think you can push the bank all the way to zero for maybe a 50-year mortgage at 1% and don't put up any money. You can afford a very small interest payment forever. I wouldn't give them any money for that building. That's just an opinion. David, you want a historic entrance to the town? Hey, that isn't a terrible idea. But you've got to do more due diligence on what is in that building and what it's going to cost you if you sign the deed. We, we are aware of that. And I do take issue that, that you say that we don't uh, maintain our buildings. Um, I think that we have made an effort to maintain our buildings, and as far as the LaShot property, uh, it was this board that brought, well, actually the previous board, um, when I was first selectman with uh, David and Dan Gilbert, that brought the, the problems with the LaShot property to the attention of the town. And we just fixed the foundation uh, through funds raised by the Friends of LaShot, and they're actively working on that. Um, and as far as other properties, we realized going into them that, that some of them, um, uh, like the Heady House that we were just going to make is eye candy and that was decisions made by previous boards of selectmen and, and we've accepted that. Um, as far as this property goes, we are well aware that there is in, no insulation in the house and that we would probably need to put substantial work into it. And all of that will be disclosed publicly in terms of what we have to do. This is just the initial conversation, Don, and I think that the public deserves the right to I'll make this decision about whether in fact we should or shouldn't purchase the property. Absolutely. Many, many people have approached me once that house went on the market and said, why isn't the town purchasing it? And the truth of the matter is, because of the $1.2 million price tag, I said, uh-uh, no way. But I can tell you right now, the bank isn't giving it to us for free. The house is valued at uh, over $900,000, close to a uh, million dollars. So that's why I thought once we finally negotiated down to 750, uh, that it really was a reasonable purchase price. Any other comments, Julie? Um, I think this is an opportunity for the town, and I, I think sometimes the stars were aligned, and this might be one of those times. I wasn't supposed to be on this docket tonight, so I'm glad I was here for this. Um, one of the things that I've done after the Newtown tragedy. Um, the our committee was looking at doing a walkable loop trail, but it went on school property. Once everything happened, we had to rethink that. Um, just last week, in my rethinking, I did a walk, and um, we did a rough plan of a three-quarter mile loop around town. Some paths were already in place. We know those two interse intersections are being redone. The only place where on all the sides of this walkable village loop that we see linking the town center to both our beautiful um, town hall and the library is that corner. That's the only place. Um, from our meeting yesterday, one of my jobs for this, um, this month was to go and look at the survey and see if that stone wall was actually on uh, state property, town property, or Mr. Gadeira's property. I have no idea the bank still owned it. Um, I remember when that was m even more than 1.2 million for sale. So I, I think it is a um, opportunity where the time has come, and I hope with due diligence, as you say, we get to buy it and purchase it. Any other comments? Yes, sir, Mr. Harper. Uh, Mark Harper. Uh, I'm one of the ones that came and talked to the town when the property came on the market because uh, many of the locals feel that it's the only acre of property or the only piece of property that would then complete the entire 90 acres that we own on this side of the road and it would connect everything together here. And for years we were unable to do anything because a private business was being conducted there, but now we have an opportunity to get a hold of that property and then do something with it, which would uh, hopefully be very beneficial for the town and the taxpayers. 
I'm not too happy about selling uh, Jarvis property just yet. You're going to have to convince me about that. But um, buying that property, absolutely, I'm in favor of that. And I, I know that there's a lot of other people that are in favor of it. Thank you. You know, again, I'm bringing all this up for public discussion, and I think it really needs to be a decision of the, the community. So, any other comments, Mr. Bergson? Uh, you have the uh, 900000 to a million that you mentioned. Is that the current tax assessment, or is that a recent appraisal? That's a recent appraisal. Okay. What is the current tax assessment? It would be 70, 70 or 75%, I forget which, of that. How do we stand on the Castle Booze project we did like six years ago? They told us what we had to improve on all our existing properties that we currently own. Uh, we've been chipping away at that. We have been putting money into the capital budget, and, and you know most of those improvements were on the school side. On the town side, uh, we did, I think one of the first projects we did was the roof, right, Woody? That was part of the Castle Booze, as well as we replaced the boilers in the building this year. So we are moving forward with our capital plan. Any other comments? Lucy. Lucy Golden. Um, as one of those people that nagged you about, yes, we should gobble this up, I'd like to congratulate you on what you've managed to do with getting us this far. And I'm very hopeful that uh, David's dream is going to come true because I'm on his team. Thank you, Lucy. Anyone else? Okay, so what I would like to do is um, start publicizing this because this is our first conversation with the public. And then uh, I don't want to put it on our next agenda because our next meeting is when we're going to be discussing the budget. And I don't want it to get lost in that. So what I'd like to do is uh, just move this, uh, we'll have this the first item on our agenda, public comment on the March 7th agenda. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm, sure. All right, good. So. Uh, if you'd like to comment, uh, feel free to come to that meeting or send comments to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, we really do care about what you have to say, and I think that this is going to have to be uh, a community decision. So uh, please tell your neighbors about this as well. Okay, moving on to item number nine on our agenda is discussion decision regarding amendments to the current firearms ordinance. Okay, we have, um, I I'd like to break this up into two separate areas um, of discussion. The first area of discussion are the changes that we need to make to the existing firearms ordinance to make it relevant and make sure that the definitions are in line with the state statute. And then the second part of the discussion, uh, which we can have afterwards, is how we can fit in the storage requirements, which the three of us felt so strongly of, in a way that is consistent with DC versus Heller and yet still conveys uh, what we feel is important in town. So Dennis, why don't you start off the discussion uh, regarding the changes that you're proposing with um, Article Three firearms as it stands. Sure. Um so um, I think as most people know, we've had a firearms ordinance since um, in town since before 1990. It was last updated in 1990. Um, and the real focus um, of the ordinance is to uh, make sure that uh, firearms are used safely in town. And it was really drafted uh, at a time when the town was um, becoming more populated, more densely populated. Um, and there was a concern that um, the town needed to make sure that the use of firearms for residential target shooting was, was done in a uh, careful and safe way. Um, and so it's, it's an ordinance that's uh, appropriate for our town, may not be appropriate for other towns, but um, it, was, it was specifically designed to promote safety here and, and, to, and to recognize the importance of uh, the use of firearms for recreational purposes. Um, we, in, in looking through the ordinance over the past several months, uh, we've identified some areas in which it needed updating. Uh, some of the definitions that were used in the, um, in the ordinance were um, out of date. Um, some of them were uh, inconsistent with uh, Connecticut state law. Um, and um, so, so we decided that it was important to take a look at it and 
make sure that it's updated and, and relevant for, for today, as Gail said. Um, so um, I've um, made some suggestions to um, make changes to it. Uh, um, some are, mo most are not very significant um, and, and really are technical. Um, and it, it essentially retains the structure and balance that it has had for the last uh, 22 years. Um, the um, one thing that we've done is the existing firearm applied to um, what was called all other weapons, which, which included a variety of different things, which was very broad and vague. So we've taken that out. Um, second, we've, uh, uh, con as I said, conformed the definitions to uh, Connecticut state law. Um, there is a uh, provision in the ordinance for uh, the use of firearms uh, for self-defense. Uh, again, that, that was not consistent with Connecticut state law, um, so changes were proposed to that. Um, there was also a provision that all uh, that nothing in the in the ordinance should be construed as being inconsistent with any state law. We added federal law as well, so it's really really more technical than anything else. Um, and so, I think um, I would I would ask for input on that from the board and from the public. Okay. Well, our next step is to schedule a public hearing after we review it today. Um, although I'll be happy to take comments from the public after we discuss it. Um, what I would like to do is read through the ordinance so that people have an idea of what we're talking about. Sure. Okay, so uh, Article 3, Firearms, Section 7.8-46, Legislative Findings, Purpose and Intent. It is found that the use of firearms in the town of Weston for residential target practice in light of the town's growing population and diminishing open space endangers the health and safety of the town residents. Accordingly, it is found necessary to the general welfare of the town and its residents that the use of firearms in the town be regulated and controlled so that the health and safety of the town residents may be protected. Any comments on that section? Okay. Uh, section 7.8-47, definitions. For the purposes of this article, certain words are defined as follows. Firearm shall have the same meaning as that provided under state law. Machine gun shall have the same meaning as that provided under state law. Assault weapon shall have the same meaning as that provided under state law. One of the reasons why we're doing this is because we know at the state legislative level, they are looking into these definitions and what the definition should be. We want to make sure that whatever we put in place here is consistent with what the state is going to be doing, and then this way we won't have to go back and change that. Uh, landowner means the legal or beneficial owner of a parcel of land or a tenant of such owner or an authorized agent or invited guest of such owner or of such tenant or a member of the immediate family of such owner or tenant or any other person in possession of a parcel of land by legal right. Immediate family shall include the spouse or children of such owner or tenant. Residential target practice means shooting at a fixed object in a place zoned as residential in the zoning regulations of the town of Weston. Residential target practice shall not include trap shooting, ski shooting, and shooting at sporting clays with shotguns in which clay targets are thrown to simulate birds in flight. Um, I actually have a question about that. Why does that not include those? I mean, why are we allowing people to shoot guns willy-nilly? Um, I wasn't around in 1990, but I think the, the intention there was um, that uh, skeet shooting is regularly practiced at the uh, Western Gun Club and the Western Field Club. And there was no intention to, and I see Mark nodding, I, I guessed right. Um, and I right. think there was no intention of regulating the use of firearms in those locations because there was no concern about safety there because it's supervised and, uh, and uh, safe. But those aren't residential. I think maybe we should sort that out a little bit. But also, isn't it a certain piece of property? Like if you want a certain amount of acres, you could also do it. Well, one of the one of the things that um, you know I do want to include to this is is we don't talk about what the requirements are, uh, and I believe there's state requirements. Isn't that correct, Mark? About uh, the buffer zones that need to happen on parcels of property if you're going to have any kind of target practice. 
Uh, but one of the things that is clear, when you're shooting targets at, in a residential property, what is really meant by that is that you're hitting something against something that has a buffer. So if you're doing skeet and you're shooting up in the air, you're not hitting against something that has a, a buffer zone, which is really what my concern is. So um, I do think Field Club and the Western Gun Club have been in, you know, excellent neighbors and, and their safety record is beyond compare. The Western Gun Club has not had an accident in the 80 years uh, that they've been in existence. And in fact, they came to our last meeting and spoke in favor of increased safety regulations to be put in this. So I just think we might need to, to sort that out, which we can do before that. Okay, section, any other comments no, on that, David? Point. Okay, section 7.8-48, prohibition. Uh, no person, sh A, no person shall discharge any machine gun or assault weapon in the town of Weston. B, no person shall discharge any firearm for residential target practice in the town of Weston except for the following. Number one, a landowner on his or her property who has received a residential target practice permit from the Chief of Police of the Town of Weston, who has taken necessary precautions to ensure that any bullet, pellet, or projectile is combined strictly to said landowner's property. Number two, a peace officer or a member of the Armed Forces of the United States or the State of Connecticut, or an authorized messenger or bank guard, and only when such person is acting in the performance of his or her duties as such. Excuse me, can I just interrupt here? Mm -hmm. um, these are footnoted as well with definition. We talk about some of these terms, such as peace officer, that is included in a footnote uh, de defining what a peace officer is. So just to be clear. Okay. And three, any person when acting to defend himself or herself or a third person from what he or she reasonably believes to be the use or imminent use of physical force. And C, no person under the age of 16 years shall discharge any firearm anywhere in the town of Weston except that persons between the ages of 12 years and 16 years may discharge a firearm for residential target practice pursuant to the provisions of subsection B of this section, provided that such firearm is discharged in the presence of and under the supervision of the person's parent, legal guardian, school, or camp official. Any comments on that new section? Okay. Uh, section 7.8-49, application for permit. A, any person wishing to apply for a permit under 7.8-48 uh, B, shall fill out and submit an application provided by the Chief of Police to the Town of Weston. B, no such permit for residential target practice shall be issued unless the applicant proves to the satisfaction of the Chief of Police, the Town of Weston, the following. Number one, that the applicant has passed the Connecticut Conservation Education Firearm Safety Course or is the holder of a valid pistol permit issued by the State Department of Public Safety. Production by the applicant of a certificate of passage of such course of a copy of such original permit shall be proof of the same. And two, that the applicant has constructed a backstop which will confine any bullet, pellet, or projectile strictly to the landowner's property. You know, right there is why we have to kind of change the definition of residential and maybe meet out um, uh, non-residential. What's the word I'm looking for? You know. Commercial. Commercial, Commercial. thank you. Um, any comments on that section? I'm going to. I've I've gotten some input from the public since this has been publicized, so I'm just going to save it until you finish yep, reading, so fine. that we we can get the full thing out there. Okay, section 7.8-50, state and federal regulations applicable. Nothing herein shall be construed to permit the use, possession, or discharge of any firearm for any purpose otherwise prohibited or regulated under any statute or regulation of the state of Connecticut or any state agency or the United States government. And section 7.8-51, penalty. Any person who violates the provisions of this article shall be subject to a fine of $250 for each such violation. This penalty shall apply to the parent or legal guardian of any person who violates the provisions of Section 7.8-48B. Okay. okay. Comments? Uh, David, I have some comments. Come in. Um, I just want to pass on some, some uh, comments that I've received from members of the public, uh, which I, I think are very valuable. Um, one is, um, relates to the exception for the use of firearms by a, a peace officer. Uh, for some reason, Connecticut state law limits that to a uh, state peace officer or a federal officer enforcing the drug laws. I don't know why it's limited that way. I think it needs to be broadened to any state or federal officer authorized to enforce criminal law. Okay. S only state have a local or local. Any it includes local. It doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Any state or federal officer. 
authorized to enforce any criminal law. To enforce. Okay. Once we make all these changes tonight, we'll make sure that we get it up on the website tomorrow so people can look at the, the document in total. Okay. Uh, the second relates to the requirements for a permit, um, which is in um, 7849. 7849. Um, under B1, uh, the existing ordinance requires that the applicant have passed the Connecticut Conservation Education Firearm Safety Course or be the holder of a valid pistol permit. Um, the suggestion has been made that that be broadened to include any equivalent uh, firearm safety course, and I think there are many out there that are uh, equivalent or possibly better, and so I think it's appropriate to expand and that. All the, or the equivalent. Okay. And who is the arbiter of that? Is the chief of police? Is there yeah. yeah. whether that alternate course is appropriate? Right. right. Chief of police is yeah. the ultimate. Um, and the, the third um, issue relates to the uh, section uh, 48B3, which is self-defense. Um, that, uh, again, Connecticut state law has an extensive uh, provision relating to self-defense and when it can be applied. I think we should just incorporate that. Uh, this, this is meant to summarize, but um, I think it would be better, again, for the same reasons as, as the other definitions, to use the Connecticut state definition, which is very extensive and, and well-drafted. And what is the term as a defined? Do you what? have language for that, or I, I'll, I will, I'll suggest it. To is you it a definition of a term that isn't being incorporated, or no? It's the con it's the it's concept of self defense. Right. Okay. okay, so you're going to broaden uh, section three of that. I will. And you'll write up language and get it to Judy. Okay. Any other? Uh, no, that's that's all I have. Okay, David. Any other comments on? No, I think, uh, I think that, that we're, you know, as, as we've said all along, we're making incremental steps in improving something that was uh, nearly 30 years old. Um, am I doing my math right? 20, 20 plus years old. Um, and I think, you know, the bigger picture, I think it's unfortunate that, um, that this discussion that we've been engaged in since December has been cast as a seize their guns um, discussion. It was in no way ever um, cast in that light. It was meant to be a a thoughtful um, consideration of something that was in existence and a way of bringing it into the 21st century and certainly bringing it to 2013, recognizing that there have been some events that, that caused it to be a much more topical discussion. Um, I, I, I've thought a lot about a couple of the comments that were made at our um, last hearing that we had in the, in the, um, in the uh, middle school cafeteria, and one really sticks with me. Um, you know, several people got up and said, we don't have a gun problem in Weston. And they're right. And I used the example of when I was growing up in seventh grade, a morning in February, where we had a fire in our house. Well, I had said the day, I could have said the day before, we don't have a fire problem in our house. Um, and we put in an alarm afterwards. You were not gonna have a gun problem in Weston until we have a gun problem. And I think that not discussing it, not considering it, not deliberating and not involving the public in that discussion would be negligent on our part. Um, most communities that have had the terror inflicted upon them that many communities have had didn't have a gun problem until they had one. So I think that it is incumbent on us um, as per the definition of what a select, what a board of selectmen's responsibilities are that we do consider this. And um, I also take issue with other comments that were made that, why should Weston deal with this? Let someone else do it. Well, we said at our first meeting when we discussed this that it has to start, the discussion and the deliberation, regardless of the outcome, has to occur locally, has to occur in, in communities, and has to reflect the values of our community. And I think that one thing that we have all three of us learned is that the, the, um, the passions appear to be much, much, much stronger from outside of Weston than from inside of Weston. The people in Weston have been very level-headed about it. Regardless of which side of the discussion they are coming from, they've been very thoughtful, as a rule, very thoughtful and very um, 
They've, they've given their comments in a thoughtful, analytical, and um, well-reasoned manner. Um, and I think then that we are taking the right steps. I personally feel that it would be wonderful to do more. Um, I think when I look at statistics, um, when I look at the number of gun deaths since Newtown at uh, 1,624, um, either uh, suicide or in other sorts of use by one person on another, 1,624 gun deaths since Newtown. That is a tragedy, mm -hmm. and that is a tragedy that must be addressed, and it can be addressed in many, many, many different ways. My concern is that the discussion um, focus too much on mental health. I think it is an issue, but I also recognize that in research done as recently as 2005 by the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies, that's the Academy of Science and other national entities, stated that people with mental illnesses are responsible for no more than 5% of all violent acts. You have to address the mental health. It's not something we have the ability to, to deal with in our town. We don't control those records. We don't have access to it. We do have public health services that deal with it. But it's not something where we, as a board of selectmen, can address public health without well, mental health law. I, I have to tell you, I, I disagree about that. We can't address mental health law, but we can address mental health. Um, we have a social worker in the school. We hired a youth services director that has a uh, background that can work with the schools to help students and their families. And um, Dennis and I sat in on a discussion last night with the Board of Education, Police Commission was invited to attend as well, uh, to start the discussion about whether we should have a school resource officer in the schools. And one of the things that I like about a school resource officer is that it really does bridge that gap between mental health and um, uh, police protection in the schools. And that school resource officer is the one who um, knows which kids are doing drugs, which kids are drinking, and who's that isolated kid at the lunch table and keeps an eye on what's going on there so that maybe we can help identify those potential Adam Lanzas and get them help before it gets to that stage. Yeah, and I think that's an incredibly important... Don't get, me, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's not an issue that needs to be addressed. I'm picking up the theme don't focus on guns, focus on mental health. They go hand in hand. And you're right in terms of the resources that the town has put in terms of dollars spent and, and right. bodies hired. That's, that's not my issue. I would love to do more, but I recognize the realities of what we can do. I think uh, you know we've seen with the state of New York that you know, Europe or Chicago, perfect example. You can't be an island. Um, when you have I-95 running up the Northeast Corridor, um, we can do whatever we want here, but that doesn't prevent anything from outside the community coming into the community. And that's why I think that we are doing the right thing by stepping back and saying that we will guide our actions in, in line with those of the state and, and the federal level. Um, but I think that this is a very good step that is being taken. I, um, I commend Dennis for doing the Yeoman's work and, and, and putting it together. Um, but I think it really reflects the, the combined views of this board. Um, in terms of how to take the next step and to ensure that the dialogue continues because I don't want this, as we said with the plastic bags, we don't want to say something and then have it go away. Happened in 1990 and 20 years later, not many people were aware that there was even an ordinance. I don't want this discussion to end when we have this, when we end up voting on what the ordinance should read. Um, I, I'm not, and that re reiterates what we've said from day one. Okay, um, we are joined by uh, our Senator, Senator Tony Boucher. Uh, who serves as co-chair of the School Safety Subcommittee of the Gun Violence Task Force. Did I get that right? Yes. And is there anything that you'd like to add to this discussion? No, I think what you're doing is very valuable. And I think it's important for us to listen to the communities as well. Uh, it's, for me, uh, particularly important that we set some guidelines on that particular subcommittee, uh, but yet not necessarily prescribe exactly uh, the kind of security measures you want to put in place in Weston because each community and school system is different. And I know the last thing you probably are looking for is a very expensive mandate, and yet we've had some very thorough discussions just as of yesterday even with all manners of experts at the state level, at the national level, uh, and, and private consulting firms and so forth. We're going to continue 
on Monday by, by having forensic uh, clinical psychologists address the uh, not just the mental health issues, but how it relates to school security as well, and uh, others that are nationally known. So we, we do want to make sure we have a, a very important uh, discussion around every community having a security plan that has components to it, but that you have an array of things and options you can put in place that you might be able to afford because as the state, as you know, has some limited financial resources, but there's also things that can put into a school construction application for each child that would have a mandated security component to make sure that different things were addressed. And most school systems in towns are looking for at least um, a guide and uh, in things that might be on a checklist, and there are, uh, to see if a grant would be approved if they considered this, this, and this section. So under school security, we talk about infrastructure needs, we talk about plans in place that incorporate your local law enforcement, as well as your school community, as well as your facilities managers, uh, as well as even your custodians that know a little bit about that. Uh, and there's many different infrastructure changes and improvements that can be made. But you also want to talk about process, procedure, uh, best practices uh, as to what to do in the event of an occurrence. Uh, and then you also have the mental health component of that that you just discussed. And police departments are coming forward to talk about their access to data and records. And should there be centralized um, in the school system even of an anonymous centralized reporting system that all matters of individuals and, and uh, that are affected could tap into. So, and it, there's also lots of privacy issues put right. on this as well. So there's an ordinate amount of effort now being put into this uh, in a good way. But getting local input, going through this exercise is very important. And the fact that you're willing to listen to your residents and incorporate their concerns and suggestions is great. It's obvious that your local ordinances will be superseded by state ordinances just as we will be as a state superseded by federal uh, changes. What I understand though is less likely that federal changes will occur and it will be much more likely that state uh, regulations may change or be improved upon and I'm pleased that Connecticut wasn't the first one necessarily out of the box in total reactive mode but has taken a more deliberative approach to this and get as much input as possible. I also want to, if I could, uh, say that there's concerns about rushing too quickly, not having the proper process of public hearing. Some are concerned about that, where they can actually react to a bill that has language in it. I can assure you that this process, though, will uh, does have public hearings, does include the leadership of all the Committee of Cognizance, and that although we may draft some language, that there is a, a consensus around so that we can get something that is doable and passable that we've also looked into uh, not rushing the process and actually having a public hearing once that language is constructed so in fact uh, people can react to and have time not a rush put it on the table like it's often been seen a 24 hours for a 500 page bill no this process will probably give uh, quite a bit of time and be disseminated, distributed online, uh, so that people can react to it, and then maybe have a public hearing for that, that bill that may be moving forward. So I, I think there's um, a tremendous amount of effort being expended that it is uniquely being done in a bipartisan fashion. As you just said, you know, there's eight members from each side of the political aisle, and there's, four, there's members from the House and the Senate, there's co-chairs on both the Republican side and the Democratic side, which typically, if you're a minority party, you do not have full uh, status as a as a chairman. And there's uh, been a very conscious effort to even give the chairs equal time to ask questions and to uh, certainly uh, be in charge of the proceedings as well. So I, I think I'm feeling uh, fairly good about the process. Now, what we end up with is going to be very interesting. And no question, the gun language and gun control language is the most controversial aspect to it. Probably the next controversial aspect is the mental health committee, where the issue of involuntary commitment might be something hugely controversial. On the school security, 
I think the big controversy was should we arm teachers or not and staff? And I can report to you that it seems like 80% of almost every group uh, says they're against that, but they are very much 50-50 on whether you should have armed resource officers mm -hmm. and or police, and school districts have already moved ahead because of their concern uh, to put processes in place right now in that regard, uh, even before any legislation comes forward. And that's well and good, but again, it's a financial commitment as well. Uh, and I'm really pleased that you're having this thorough discussion. I know it's been difficult. Uh, I, uh, you know, doing a town ordinance is probably not as common in most of the towns around, but if it's done in a way that really reflects the community, uh, then you could be successful at it. And just wait and see if we do something there that might change maybe some of the language that you have in place. Thank you, I appreciate your comments. Okay, um, if neither of you have any other comments on um, the existing ordin ordinance and the draft changes that we're gonna make, I do wanna have a conversation about the storage requirement. Uh, when we began this discussion, this was something that the three of us felt very strongly about. And, you know, we've had some bumps in the road along the way trying to find a way that, number one, is um, legal um, so that we're not violating um, D.C. versus Heller or any of the other uh, constitutional rulings. Uh, that's fair to residents that want to have access to their guns uh, you know, in case a burglar is breaking into their house and, you know, we've kind of batted around a couple of different ideas from, you know, having people have those special storage lock boxes where you can just fingerprint things that runs open. Uh, but then I think we're running into problems with the ACLU who's going to claim that you're not getting fair access because of the cost. So after going around this, you know, it, what it comes down to is it's very difficult on the municipal level. Uh, to put laws in place that impact storage. However, after conversations with the town attorney, I found out that we can in fact put a preamble in place um, that recommends securing ordinances, which would not be um, you know, a legal requirement, um, but I think reflects what I think our community would think is important. And this is something we'll hear a little bit more or have um, you know, certainly allow for public discussion at the public hearing that we schedule. Uh, so this is what I was thinking. You guys are just uh, reading it for the first time. I just gave you a copy of it. So um, obviously it's going to need some, some work. Um, Connecticut General Statute, and I have to figure out what that number is, charges boards of selectmen with the responsibility to promote peace, safety, good government, and welfare of the municipality and its inhabitants. The Board of Selectmen believes that the misuse of firearms by individuals who are not properly trained and qualified to use them can endanger public health and safety, and that safe storage practices are essential to public welfare. The Board recommends securing firearms and ammunition in a manner that will prevent unauthorized access when not in use, preferably in a locked gun safe or similar enclosure. So Dennis, these are mostly your words that I took. You had suggested a resolution which um, I really thought we needed something stronger that we could codify in our code book. Uh, so thank you for the words, and I okay. totally copied them. <laughs> so any, any comments on putting in a preamble? I, 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 I think we are, our, our objectives in getting it um, to have the force of an ordinance is very much as you say, that. Um, there are legal challenges which would probably be successful um, in keeping with uh, Supreme Court decisions and interpretations. Um, you know, there is a requirement, of a, a very a rigid requirement in when there is a child under 16 in the house. It's it, not doesn't, really it, 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 it doesn't say you have to lock, it says safe secure, storage. It says it's secure location. Secure location. And one of the things that I testified about at the public hearing was I, I think the state needs to define what secure location is. So that's, that's where is. I was heading with this. That's where I was heading. That, that I think that one thing that we could include in here is the reference to however that is resolved at the state level. Um, that secure means something very different if you have a, some, a, an infant who's crawling or a toddler who's crawling versus having a, a 16 year old in the house. I don't see any reason why the concept goes away when your child turns 16 in a day. Um, Secure is secure, and um, I think that there needs to be greater clarity in terms of what we mean by it mm -hmm. and what the state means by it. Um, 
I don't think we can legally go to the point of having a lockbox. Um, but I think that as long as we are putting this sort of preamble, or if we do put this sort of preamble to the article in place, that we be fairly specific about what we mean by um, what we're asking people to do um, in safe storage. What do we actually mean by that? Okay. Um, this does not have the force of an ordinance. Um, force, it does not have force of law, right, it but is it, is the law. Sense, it is the sense of the Board of Selectmen in keeping with its mandate as you define it here. Okay, well we can work on wordsmithing and bring yeah. it back to our next meeting, which would be before that. Yes. Uh, if I may um, intrude on this, I think um, you will see most definitely there are things that are much more consensus oriented. Two of the things that you will probably see in the gun ch uh, law changes will be something with regards to background checks, and you will see quite a bit on storage law change. And quite frankly, uh, the, the uh, gun rights advocates were the first to come forward to provide some very good language in that area. Excellent language that I passed on actually to that committee that they're actually using. And so you will see, uh, and I think we're very pleased to see that they are going to move very strongly in that direction, clarify and make even stronger storage, it can be much beyond that what you're discussing. That would be great. And if I can get that language from you, that would be helpful. Thanks. Dennis? Yeah, I would only say that, you know, I think we, we all recognize that um, you can't uh, eliminate uh, gun violence through laws. Um, it really is a much more holistic approach that you have to take. And um, many people have pointed out that laws are uh, broken by people who break laws. And so uh, to me, the idea of giving the community a sense of uh, what the Board of Selectmen recommends in terms of safety is appropriate because uh, we have a good community here and I think that I think our community will follow it um, if it's reasonable and um, I think that um, the overall tenor of what we're doing here is trying to start a, a dialogue with those who care about this issue and make a statement about about gun safety, and I think I think this would do it. Okay. With, and there's no need for a $250 penalty because it, it won't it won't have any effect. So, are you suggesting eliminating the penalty? No, 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 I'm, no for, for the this storage. storage. Oh, for the storage, 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 it's not a it's okay. not a binding statement. So, now I think it's, it's ju just as effective as a statement of, of what the community believes. And having spoken to many many people around the community who. Uh, our um, responsible gun owners, um, there's a lot of support for the concept of uh, safe storage and most are already engaged in it and there's, and there's no harm in our reminding people that it's an important issue. Okay, terrific. So what I will do is I will email you this. You guys can wordsmith it, get back to me, and then we can discuss it at our uh, next meeting. And um, what I will do is I will put up on the website what we're considering uh, for the preamble as well as for the changes to Article 3 for firearms. Okay, do you guys have any other comments about any of these? Okay, uh, anyone from the audience would like to comment? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, first Quickly, all, Don. I want to thank Mark for 1990 and thank you for taking a very guarded and good approach to just modernizing certain sections. I spoke to Dennis after one of the meetings. I would not like to see a replay of what happened in Westchester County if somebody applies to the chief for a target permit and then all of a sudden it's all over the internet, who has a gun, who doesn't have a gun, and then none of parents in town can take their kids away on vacation because houses were broken into and, and whatever. So be careful about our very strong FOI laws. And, and I think you know them very well. The other thing, and David, I know you're worried about guns in the town. And I'm going to say something that's going to offend some people. What the hell do we do about those four morons that took shotguns and blew up all the mailboxes? And the cops arrested them finally that night, but their court date isn't for eight months in October. What happened there? So that nobody's going to talk about it. There won't be a message to the community, to other kids not to do stupid things, because these kids are all scot-free until October, and God knows what will happen to them by then. So, Don, I really wish that we could change the justice system, but that's a little out of my purview. Thank you. Any, any other?
they're doing a good job. You're doing a very respectful job of, of trying to modernize something that is an issue. But Thank you. We're, we're putting you. capital we're, punishment we're, on our next. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other comments, Mr. Ferguson? Uh, yes. First of all, I totally agree with you and applaud you for changing the storage requirements. Uh, I personally would not have any problem with it being an ordinance, but I understand the, the legal difficulties in doing that. Um, David, I, I have to be honest with you. After hearing your comments, I've listened to you at, at a number of these hearings or a number of these meetings, I should say. Um, I do have to take a little bit of an issue with some of the things that you said. Um, you made a statement that you didn't feel that uh, that you thought the ordinance or the changes in the existing ordinance were misunderstood. That you know this was not designed as something to you know come out and take your guns. And I think it's your quote, and I totally believe that you think that. But as a lawyer, you know that a few words can change an entire meaning. And when you take an ordinance, an existing ordinance, that revolves around use of firearms in a town and talks about discharge for residential target shooting, and you add the words, you know, the prohibitions of ownership or possession to discharge, the old ordinance doesn't matter because that is a, a, an immense change. And I do think that, that you have to be somewhat cognizant that those words, those few changes, did you know create a firestorm, frankly. And that did come across as, you know, we are banning the ownership or possession of certain firearms. We are banning the ownership or possession of all firearms unless you have registration. That's the way the ordinance, uh, as Dennis originally drafted, spoke. Um, so I think that you have to look at the wording that you put out to begin with. And, and in all honesty, I think you have to take the blame for the fact that, you know, this ordinance wasn't misunderstood. It was just read by the public, and, and that's what the wording said. Um, I would also point out, um, we do have an existing firearms ordinance on the books, um, but one of the other bills that is proposed right now at the state legislature is uh, House Bill 6248, which I'm sure you're aware of, by Craig Miner. Um, in all honesty, this bill probably wouldn't have been proposed if you guys hadn't done what you did on January 3rd. Might, might not be. I'm actually proud of what we did. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm you, not you, gonna you, apologize, make any apologies for, for what we did. You, you, may, you may not be, but there's certainly one legislator at the state level that is put, in proposing an ordinance, and the exact statement of the purpose of the ordinance is to allow the state to regulate firearms exclusively and to preempt the regulation of firearms by municipalities. I've personally spoken to a dozen legislatures on both sides of the aisle, because this is, this is not a, a partisan issue. This isn't a, a pro-gun, anti-gun issue. Um, out of the 12 legislatures that, I've, legislators that I've talked to, they've been unanimous in agreeing with this ordinance. Now, I, it'll be interesting to, to see whether that comes out of an omnibus bill that goes through the ESERP process, or if it's another bill that actually goes through the committee process on its own. But there's certainly issues that the state has with municipalities proposing firearms ordinances. Uh, I think municipalities are totally within their right when they're talking about use of firearms within the town. I think that that can also extend to storage as well. I, I personally believe that. Some people may not. Um, but when you're talking about ownership or possession, and specifically talking about things that were in the original ordinance that was drafted, um, that is you know, what people at the state level are trying to prevent local municipalities from doing. So I think that as you look at either changes to the existing ordinance or even expanding an ordinance, if you're not satisfied with what happens at the state level, I think you have to be very cognizant that there are certain state legislatures, legislators that are, you know, are against trying to do that. Thank you for your I comments. I just have one question. Did you accuse me of being a lawyer? I am not, nor have I ever been a lawyer. Oh, so. I'm sorry. I thought I did that. No. I, I, I apologize. You made my full apology. Yes, you're a lawyer, right? Okay. I'm not a lawyer either. I know. I didn't apologize. Mr. Harper. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm 
would like to thank the Board of Selectmen for moving forward and updating a 22-year-old document. And I believe that, unfortunately, at the beginning was pretty rough there because of some of the language possibly that was in there. But I want to say that uh, Dennis and the rest of you have realized and been very receptive to the fact that there are some statutes or limitations that you have when you, you do write something like that. And I am in total support of the changes that you made. It's an old document. It needs to be updated. You're doing it. And you're doing it right. And I am, if we have a state uh, representative here, I am in favor of trying to come up with some type of legislation where the storage of firearms, except for those used in self-protection, is like a mandatory thing. Um, it will keep the guns safe and out of the hands of the criminals that are breaking into our houses. It will keep them out of the hands of our young, uh, you know, our children that live in our houses or come to visit. Um, it will also, I would think, be something that should also be included in that is the ammunition for those firearms should also be locked up. And, I, you know, as far as self-protection goes, yeah, we're all entitled to have a gun. I only need one gun for self-protection. I don't need a gun in every room. I need one gun and that's all I need, okay? So that's that. I, I would like to talk to David for one second on his remark about uh, mental illness. Maybe it's only 5% of uh, the population or the mentally ill commit these acts, but they seem to be the ones that are committing the most heinous crimes, and that is why it is important, very important, that mental health, health be discussed and be uh, dealt with. And one of those ways that we can do it is, again, keep our guns safe, keep them locked up, and keep them away from those type of people. I would like to give you some statistics that are out there and available <clears throat> for you to, to, to realize. Violent crime in the United States down 49%. Murders down 49%. However, gun ownership in the United States has almost doubled. There seems to be a correlation between the fact that now people are taking their personal safety much more positively and the, the criminal aspect is saying, whoa, you know, I'm going to have to be careful about what I do and who I do it to. Because I can tell you, every day there are stories out there of people using self-defense in order to get away from uh, violent crime. Okay, so that's something you need to remember. And okay, Mark, let's make it pertinent to the document because okay, I want well, to try to wrap it up. Pertinent. This isn't the it public hearing. Because it's all part. I'm in favor of it. I support it. I'd like to see the written the finished thing. As far as out of towners go, I don't really care what they have to say. I care about what happens in Weston. Thank you, Mark. Any other comments? No. I was going to say, Dad, I should become a national celebrity because I, I work with folks all over the country. <laughs> when you went on Morning Joe, I got text messages and calls from all over the country. Don't you live in Weston? <laughs> some, some dude named Dad is speaking to. <laughs> I hope it increases our property value. <laughs> and that's the first time that, that's the first time I was referred to him as that dude. That's, that's great. He's in California. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Mark, yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for everything you do. As our state, as our state representative to go to Steve and Tony, um, there has been violence in communities. This is one of my books from 1979. It was written in 79. And, it, and I had it in 1984 when I was taking a criminology course. And Yale did, a, Yale did a study from 60, a 30 year study on violence. And it includes guns, mental health, and Congress did it. There are volumes of stuff that does not need to be repeated. Volumes are out there. We don't need the deficit going up. So much is out there already. And it is not, per se, the guns. The guns are out there. They're with the criminals. They're going back and forth between Mexico. They're coming back and forth over the borders. There's nothing that we can do, per se, to get them out of criminals' hands. It's going to keep going on. If a criminal wants a gun, me and you can't stop it. Okay? We can't. Because they're evil. They're evil. They just came up with an MRI that could show evil, okay? 
they've done it, they've discovered it, and the Fujio Department. The point is, we want our community safe. I would like you to speak on things that keep us safe. I look at that mom who had the twins, who only had seven bullets in her magazine. Six of them she discharged, if, if you know what I'm talking about. I think it was um, South Carolina Republican Representative Lindsey Graham who spoke so eloquently. And the truth is, if there were two people in her home, she would not have been here. I have twins, so it means a lot to me. And I just want you to realize, you said you were a marksman, so you were on a marksman team. So you have had a gun. Many people up on Capitol Hill or who have never shot, they're afraid of guns. So if they're afraid of guns, maybe they don't know how to protect themselves. I come with, from a family from law enforcement. So if I ever had a school, my PTO on my block, there was always people who sat at the front door who were policemen, and they always carried. Now, it wasn't the resource officer that everybody knew about it. It's just that, oh, so-and-so's dad was taking the check-in that day, and everybody was a volunteer, and nobody knew. But that dad was checking in everybody at the front door. Then another dad, then another dad, then another dad. And it was just because everybody was good and respected one another. And you can't keep the bad people out, and you can't keep the good people with guns out also. So when people like my friends, like Dawn Egan, who went to the PTO, and all the Western Young Women's League, when they say they want to publish everybody's name, I say, and there's another young woman who said, I want to know when my child goes on a play date if there's a gun in the home. Well, don't send your child to a play date if you don't know the people well enough, because guess what? It's not going to help. Now, we, we agree that there were privacy issues, which is why we removed the discussion of registration at the local level at our last meeting, because we, we agree with, with you on that. But I know that you do things, and I want you to really take to heart that you want to protect all of us and our children. And you have to do it the right way, because evil does exist in this world. And the ones here who have a gun, or don't have a gun, whoever doesn't want to say anything about anything, you have to take the good with it, and those who want to stay on the peaceful side, it is not a utopia, although we would love it to be that way. But the little boy in my class, who I had many children who I had in preschool, and I've been a teacher for a long time. I am almost done. Okay. But he was a little boy in Wilton who stabbed his father to death. And you know what? That little boy, I told the dad, please keep the violence out of the home. Could you please get him some help? And when he went to Wilton, he was one of those high maintenance children. In our school district, many parents send them here because we have special ed needs. Us, Westport and Wilton, we get a lot of children who need mental health. And that's what we need to focus on. The high maintenance children who grow up and it is in third grade, it is, it is proven that children who have too much violence in third I, grade, I am going to ask you to wrap study, up, please. 30 year study, volumes of books, if there's too much violence from whatever it is, third grade, those are the offenders into youth. Do all the research, Yale, Harvard, wherever you want. I have many, many things of violence. Thank, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Okay, so uh, our next step is to schedule a public hearing. Uh, Police Commission did ask to review uh, the changes once we had our quote unquote final changes to our draft ordinance. They are meeting on March 5th. Dennis, hopefully you'll be in town. Because um, I will be in Turks and Caicos. Um, if not, uh, it'll be David. David. <laughs> it'll be David. <laughs> Listen, I had them last time. Uh, and then what I'd like to do is schedule the public hearing for March 7th, two days after that, and then that way we can incorporate um, public comments as well as police commission comments, and then we can take the vote that night on changes. Can I suggest a, a different day? Sure. Because um, I'm not available March 7th, so um, I was, could we make it a week later? Uh, Are we doing it the next meeting? 
we can do it at the next meeting, which is March 2021. Okay. Let's do that. Please. Yep, we can do that March 21st. Okay. We're still meeting. Thank you. Okay, would someone like to make a motion to schedule the public hearing? I move that we schedule a public hearing on changes to the fire alarm the ordinance on March 21st at 7 p.m. in the town hall meeting room. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda, David, is request for property tax refunds. Yeah, I did two in a row. Yes, okay. I move to approve property tax refunds amount of $10,644.65 as listed on the February 7th Board of Selections meeting agenda. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Okay, uh, moving on to open item updates. Um, grants. Uh, I don't really have any grant information. I did want to talk a little bit, though, about the governor's proposed budget impact on Weston. Um, you guys now have our budget books. Yep. Uh, and what I was proposing is uh, budgeting down any state aid by 10% because I was concerned about um, where those numbers would fall out. Uh, according to the governor's proposed budget, which still needs to be voted on by the state legislature, it looks like we're going to be um, down at least half of that. Um, and it looks like a decrease in revenue uh, of $62,000. Uh, they're eliminating the pilot program. They're eliminating the um, uh, Passion Tucket, the Pe uh, we just got the Pequot grant. Um, they are eliminating um, municipal revenue sharing bonus pool, which was a big win for us a couple of years ago. Uh, so at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm glad I put that into the budget, and obviously it'll be part of our budget discussion. Wait, I'm, am Let's, I reading this incorrectly? I'm seeing that the budgeted amount for state aid is going from actual of 1.216 to 1.278. That's an increase in in aid, not a decrease. No, there was. That's a that's a positive. You know, you're right. Yeah. So. <laughs> Duh. I read all of these negatives, negative 62, right, and I added offset, up that. But by they're offset, offset by, by a couple the, of them. By the town aid to right. roads. Okay. So never mind. Um, but there is one um, item that's coming up which is of great concern to me, and that the governor is proposing uh, a change in um, the municipal motor vehicle tax. And we ran through the numbers today, and there are two different scenarios that they're considering. One is uh, removing the property tax totally on vehicles under 28.5. And another proposal, which seems to be popping up, and I'm not quite sure which one they're looking at, is um, uh, a proposal to exempt the first 20,000 of every car. So we thought it was the first one that they were talking about with eliminating property taxes for vehicles uh, valued under 28.5. And that would have a, tyranda, a horrendous effect on us because it would decrease the revenue by, ready for this, $1,977,614. That's the so, one that exempts any car under 28.5? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so hmm. our, our total uh, grand list number for that is $114,926,893. So, um, I did speak to Senator Boucher when she was here tonight. I did send emails to Representative Shaben as well as Senator McKinney and uh, working closely with Betsy Guerra, who's the Executive Director of the Connecticut Council of Small Towns, um, to try to um, work on that because we, we can't have that. We just can't. Wow. Um, so, so much for holding us harmless. So that's 62000 bucks, and the other one is I not. Know. So that's a drop I in the bucket. I know. I should have looked at this a little bit more closely before bringing it up publicly because I really looked at all the, the negative. negative. I saw that negative 62 for the municipal sharing pool. Okay. Um, personnel handbook. I actually did not bring my copy tonight. Nor did I. Nor did okay. I. Okay. And you can put it on the agenda. Yes, it is. Under updates. That's when Gail okay, was going to update us. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> so we are definitely, definitely going to have it on the next agenda. We've got to get moving on this. Okay. We've only been talking about it for a year. Tom, glad to see you. Glad to see I pushed you so hard on that. Okay, is there any other business to come properly before the meeting? Hearing none, discussion approval of the Board of Selectmen meeting minutes. Motion, please. 
I move to approve the minutes of January 17, 2013, Board of Selectmen's minutes as presented. I will second them with a compliment to Judy to um, to get all of that meeting onto minutes was okay. is truly commendable. Those were some hairy minutes. Yes. I was glad you guys read them because some of it was hard to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, uh, I'd like a motion to enter into executive session. The purpose of the executive session is uh, to discuss the proposed settlements of the DPW filed grievance and prohibitive practice charges related to Kevin Lane. Um, Tom, is that something we need to vote on publicly? Yeah. Yes, if you're going to approve it, you, you will come out and you will vote. Okay, so I am um, anticipating coming out of executive session for a vote. Would someone like Right, so would someone make a motion to enter into executive session? I move to enter into executive session for the purposes so defined. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you.